My name is Nick Mottern, and uh, I'm a, a visitor to Brooklyn. Um, thank you. And uh, I, I've come here uh, with uh, a crew of people uh, from Westchester County to do what's called a no drones tour, and we've been out on the street corners uh, uh, in several places uh, for the last two days visiting with people. And we felt uh, one of the key uh, ingredients, one of the key purposes of this particular tour is to go to where people are and speak to them, uh, go to the mountain instead of expecting the mountain to come all the time to uh, where we are. And uh, it's been very touching because a lot of people um, are very interested in this. They, uh, many people know very little about drone warfare. And what we use is this uh, replica up here, of a Reaper drone. Usually it's not at that height, but uh, it does make people want to ask questions, and as soon as people start asking questions, they're open uh, to learning. And so it's been very, very satisfying. Um, I should say that uh, one of the most uh, moving things yesterday, and, and, and for the time we've been in Brooklyn, is that uh, when we were down by Trader Joe's at Atlantic and Court Street, a man came up and said, that's an excellent replica of a Reaper drone, and I said, well, uh, thank you, uh, but how, how do you know that? He said, well, I was in the Army, and uh, he said, I have PTSD, and when he started to say it, he started to go, go like that, and he said, I was in the Army, but I was stationed in Egypt, and I was torturing people uh, during the beginning of the uh, Iraq War, and so now he said, and, you know, and, and he started to do that some more, and at first I wondered if he was um, had, having a fantasy that he was living or whether he was uh, telling the truth, and, and by the time I was finished with, you know, speaking with him, uh, he was almost crying, and so it was, uh, I think something, you know, when, when people do see these weapons, it does bring out a certain kind of reality that is very, very uh, important, I think in thinking about what's going on in the world right now. Um, today, um, I, I want to start really by thanking the uh, people of uh, Brooklyn for Peace who have been uh, out on the street uh, leafleting with us, and particularly uh, Jane Karinsky, who has shepherded us around. Please, Jane, stand up. You don't have to speak. Yeah because she went around with us, uh, you know, weeks before this, showed us where we were going to go, what would be the best places, all that. And uh, uh, there are people here from Westchester, uh, uh, Gail Dunkelberger, uh, Kwame Madden, Jeff Smith, and uh, uh, George Gursky, who actually went and babys he's babysitting a couple of drones at Prospect Park so that uh, we, we didn't have to, you know, miss our appointment here. Um, today, I think that um, a characteristic of all these speakers, what's common about uh, the speakers, um, you have to fill in a question, what's common about all these people, is that um, they have a, uh, an unusual level of, uh, I'd say, physical courage and uh, intellectual courage. Uh, our first speaker, and I'm going to introduce each person as they appear so that everybody can think about them as, you know, as they're, as they're talking. Our first speaker is uh, Zora Ahmed, and she's a Pakistani woman who uh, is a law student at Fordham University. Um, she will be working this summer with the ACLU on legal cases related to uh, drone warfare. And as a Pakistani um, you can imagine that in, in this time in the United States, when Muslims were being targeted, when a Pakistani lawyer has been prevented from coming to a drone summit on April 28th that uh, Medea Benjamin will speak more about, um, it does take courage to speak up. So uh, we have to understand, I think, that the pressures on us to make 
us feel that everything is fine, everything is in a world of maybe consumer and pleasure and health that way, the undercurrent for many, many people is much, much different. And we met some of these people uh, on the street. Um, people who are struggling economically. A Pakistani man who told me about his wife being, you know, in kidney dialysis for years and how much, you know, Muslims are afraid to speak, how much money is being taken out of his pocket to deal with the health care system. So we're not trying to depress people out here, but I think what we're trying to do is to cause people to reflect and to see how they can respond to what's, what's being said, what will be said today. And so it's not that if you don't respond, there's something wrong with you, but we have been forced in many ways to be afraid by what we've been told, and we have to realize that many among us are fearful, and we have to be sympathetic to that, and we've been immersed in that. And so what we're dealing with here is our own emotions, the emotions of other people, as well as the, the specifics of drone warfare and how we respond in the midst of, of that kind of environment. So um, I think it's important just to put aside all the um, frequencies of fear and this and that, and just to listen you know, specifically to what people say and how that inspires us, and then see how we would want to uh, act. And so, uh, Zora, would you come forward? And uh, please, uh, let's give it up for Zora. Hi. Thank you for having me, Nick. This is a wonderful effort, and I'm really honored to be part of it. Um, I'll be speaking about the drone strikes in Pakistan and how the drone program fits um, into the very fraught relationship between US and the U.S. and Pakistan and some of those serious legal questions that are raised by the program. So just to backtrack a little bit, um, how did we end up bombing Pakistan? Um, so the U.S. first started conducting covert strikes in Pakistan starting in 2004, but we really started to hear about them in 2008 and 2009 when they dramatically, the number of strikes dramatically increased under Obama. Uh, and Pakistan has always been a country of concern for the U.S. after 9-11, uh, but I think we can point to the 2008 presidential election campaign uh, during, in one debate, for example, the only thing that McCain and Obama agreed upon was that it was Iran and Pakistan which posed the two greatest threats to U.S. national security. Um, and it's in this context that we see the word, um, the AFPAC war emerge, um, and it's a recognition that by the U.S., by Washington, that success in Afghanistan was tied to a particular, negotiating particular relationship with Pakistan, um, and therefore justified uh, military action inside of Pakistan. Um, most of what we know about the war in Pakistan is secondhand, and for a variety of reasons. First of all, all the strikes have been taking place in the federally administered tribal areas, which is in the northwest of Pakistan. Historically, has been very isolated, has had been subject to its own uh, criminal law, own courts, um, and has been sort of under its, a different control since Pakistan was formed. Um, and to this day, it's very hard to gain access to the places that are being bombed. And it, the only way that advocates have been able to access victims is when the, is victims and survivors is that they have have come via bus into Islamabad. It's been very difficult for journalists to actually gain access to this part um, of the country. Um, on the U.S. side it's been impossible to gain any sort of information about why the U.S. thinks it's okay to be bombing uh, Pakistan, what the justifications are, what intelligence is relying upon. As Nick mentioned, the ACLU and some, some other organizations have been suing the U.S. government because it hasn't complied with its obligation under the Freedom of Information um, Act, which requires the government to disclose um, information when someone makes a request. And the U.S. government essentially says that we cannot disclose the justifications for this war or who we're targeting because it would compromise national security interests. That's all fine and good, but at the same time, you have every day in the New York Times, you read about a drone strike. And Eric Holder goes on record and talks about, in very broad and general terms, what, on what basis the U.S. targets people. So this is, you know, the secrecy is used very selectively. And essentially the U.S. is keeping the drone program secret because it can. Um, and 
that basically precludes any of us from really knowing what's going on. And the little information that we do have suggests that the civilian casualties are much higher than what the mainstream media would have us uh, would, ha would would tell us. For example, on October 31st of 2011. Uh, foreign policy, which runs its own separate tally of the drone of drone casualties, states that four to six militants died in a particular strike in uh, North Waziristan. But on the ground, Clive uh, Stafford Smith, who is a uh, uh, lawyer with Reprieve, was there, and he found out that actually two of the people killed were 16-year-old boys who were searching for information and trying to collect evidence from a prior drone strike. So clearly the information on the ground and what is reported to us are really incongruent. Um, and, but from the little anecdotal evidence that we have, we know that um, the casualty number, which is I guess 800 people, really underestimates the number of, uh, of, of civilians that have been affected. So even if we take the U.S.'s assertion that it's targeting militants at face value, there are some really important um, inconsistencies in its legal justification. So according to the authorization of the use of military force, which gave us the war in Iraq, gave us the war in Afghanistan, and is ostensibly supporting strikes in Yemen, Pakistan, and Somalia, the U.S. is supposed to be at war with Al-Qaeda and associated forces. Um, and, how, and those groups in Pakistan that are targeted, that are supposed to be associated forces, are the tariq -e taliban Pakistan, Al-Qaeda, and the Haqqani Network. Um, but if we take one of these groups, like the tariq -e taliban Pakistan, there's no suggestion that, the, that this group is in any way linked to Al-Qaeda. If anything, these group, this group may have some broad ideological alignment with uh, Al-Qaeda, but there's no actual logistical or, or military involvement. And basically the U.S. is using mere ideological alignment as the basis for targeting people. So because groups support the insurgency in Afghanistan, that becomes basis for, uh, uh, for targeting. And this targeting is based on just speculation, geographic proximity, um, and what we have is a preventative war. So the U.S. is killing people because it merely suspects that these people might become potential terrorists uh, and potential threats to, to the U.S. And essentially, we all know that preventative war doesn't exist and essentially just perpetuates its instability and creates the conditions for a next uh, stage of insurgency. And so the word militant, which is used so casually to that to permit all sorts of killing is really the only way to understand this term is that it's a word that allows us to, it's a word that's used basically to designate all those people that we can kill without feeling bad about it or without ever being held accountable for. And that's the only way that this word militant, I think, is being used um, in, in, in this war. And the result is that we have 800 people who have died, civilians, um, after 250 strikes. Um, and every day that, that, is, that increases. So the kind of war that emerges from this is a war that is hugely asymmetric, completely detached, and of course, like all wars, dehumanizing. The technology is very sophisticated. I bet, you know, whenever I've been with Nick on the street with this model drone, you get this sort of fascination from, you know, young boys, like, oh, what is this toy? It's so cool. I mean, this I think this fa the, the sophistication of the technology allow makes us believe that this is a precise and surgical war with very little cost and very little blowback. Of course, the U.S. actually never suffers the blowback. The blowback is always in Pakistan against Pakistani civilians. Um, and the geographic detachment that is permitted by the drone strikes actually allows the government to remain unaccountable and to kill indiscriminately. These drones hover in Pakistan, Waziristan, and in other parts of the federally administered tribal areas for almost f whole days and emit these horrible sonar sounds the entire time before they actually launch um, the, the, the missile. And as a result of it, people on the ground have resorted to taking anti-anxiety pills, have been taking sleeping pills to be able to cope with it. And at the same time, as Nick mentioned, we're seeing an um, increase in PTSD for, um, in, in the pilots that are operating these robots um, in Nevada and elsewhere. Um, another, I think, important thing to look at in the, in the aspect of the drone program is how the drone program fits in a very, very tense relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan. So just earlier this week, the Pakistani parliament issued a set of demands, uh, one of which was to call for an end to drone strikes and to call for an end, for, uh, end of using Pakistani um, airspace uh, to wage war in Afghanistan. Uh, 
we'll have yet to see to what extent this demand has any teeth, but I think that what it signals is that there's growing opposition within Pakistan against the drone strikes. Um, and there's been no accountability, just like I said, there's no accountability in the U.S. for the drone program. There's been very little accountability in Pakistan for the victims uh, who have suffered uh, from the drone strike. So basically what the Pakistani government has done is that it insists that it has actually given permission to the U.S. to use its airspace. It keeps on, it shifts the blame. It says, no, 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 this is Uncle Sam who's doing it, and we really have no control. Of course, the Pakistani government has allowed the drones to take off and take on, to, take, to land and take off in Pakistan. They can't operate without Pakistani approval, but the Pakistani government basically passes the buck. And you have essentially a, a, a you know, each country is just shifting the blame against each other, and that absolves both countries of responsibility. Um, at the same time, encouraged by the U.S., what you have in Pakistan is a very low intensity, a very low intensity, a low intensity war that is being waged in other parts of the tribal areas in Pakistan. Uh, the Pakistani military has waged essentially its own war of terror. Uh, it's, it has tried to eradicate terrorists through, you know, targeted offenses and through uh, very, very brutal uh, law enforcement policies. And what you see is a replication of the national security state. Um, in Pakistan. You have dis forced disappearances, uh, people held incommunicado, and we're starting to see a little bit of uh, accountability. Some of the people that have, were made disappeared by the Pakistani military were brought forward last month to the Supreme Court, um, but many of the people who were initially on that list of disappeared have actually died. Um, at the same time, it's come, the drone program has come to a huge cost. You know, so while the drone program has allowed the Pakistani government to conduct its own excesses to brutalize its own population, it's also come at a huge cost. Um, and the result is that you're seeing that you're seeing that people in Islamabad are starting to change their own policy and their own stance vis-a-vis -vis the war, um, and and to what extent they're going to comply with the U.S.'s demands. Um, finally, there are some. I think some interesting legal issues um, that come up when we're talking about the drone strikes, what we're seeing the U.S. doing is that it's conflating uh, two different paradigms to explain the war. It's claiming self-defense and it's claiming that it's in, engaged in a hot war. And basically the government is conducting lawfare. It's using the law selectively to basically shut out um, criticism and to say that yes, we're engaging with the law, but we're engaging the law in our own terms and we are making the law as we go along. Um, and that's extremely dangerous. And you hear this again and again from different pundits on the right saying that, oh, you know, the laws just really don't reflect our current day reality because, you know, uh, they don't take into consideration the fact that we are engaged in a global warfare and that uh, we're dealing with new threats. And this is, this is an asymmetric threat. But what's really happening is that the U.S. is actually engaging in an asymmetric war using drones, um, which are epitomizing the, the, the asymmetry of the situation. Essentially, it is launching a war is launching bombs on populations which have absolutely no means of retaliating because these these machines fly at least a mile up into the sky. Um, I think that's all I will say about that for the time being, um, and I will be happy to answer any questions um, during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Zora. Um, our next speaker is uh, Medea Benjamin. She's the co-founder of Code Pink. Medea um, uh, is also uh, co-founder of uh, Global Exchange, um, that uh, not only uh, as an organization had to do with fair trade, but assist and has assisted people to go to a variety of countries to understand uh, what's going on. Um, She's been arrested um, in Pakistan, interestingly enough, in 2007, um, protesting the, uh, the house arrest of a, a lawyer there. Um, and uh, this year, uh, she was arrested in Bahrain um, because uh, she had the uh, idea, I guess, that there was freedom of assembly or free speech there or something like that. And, uh, suddenly found out that uh, the uh, government uh, wasn't interested in that. They, they're allies of the United States, but they aren't interested in, in uh, free speech. Um, Medea has just written a book um, called uh, uh, Drone Warfare, uh, or, uh, Killing by Remote Control. And uh, 
I think that it's a, a huge contribution um, to the whole uh, awakening of the public about uh, drone warfare and something that is much needed. And uh, Code Pink is also organizing a summit on uh, drone warfare, uh, what can be done, um, and that will be on April 28th in uh, Washington, D.C. But uh, I think we have to uh, give Medea a lot of applause just for raising hell about stuff that really needs it. Well, thank you, and thanks to Nick for um, making these horrible models, which I guess um, uh, we got one in D.C., and it's in our office, and you kind of look up, and it reminds you of uh, just how evil this, the use of this machine is. Because let's remember, technology can be used for good, and there's plenty of ways that drones can be used for good, and we can have a nice discussion about that afterwards. Uh, but what is driving this technology is not to take food to victims of earthquakes in uh, Haiti or um, to uh, help uh, people trying to figure out what the government of uh, Syria is doing to peaceful protesters. It's really being driven by the military, by the CIA, and by countries around the world that want to catch up with the technology and have it available to do their own killing and their own spying on other people around the world as well as their own citizens. So um, I, I think it, it, it's an amazing paradox right now because we have been since 9-11 in uh, 10 years of war right now, right? Uh, the American people are tired of war. You see that in the statistics. They show that more people than ever before are sick and tired of the war in Afghanistan and want the troops to get out and think, why are we waiting till 2015 to make that happen? Why don't they come home now? And even the majority of Republicans say they want us to get out of Afghanistan. So keep that thought in your mind and then take this other thought, which is the majority of people think it is just fine to use drones against suspected militants, and that's suspected militants, right? And that majority of people includes the majority of Democrats. So here you have people sick and tired of war, and yet you have people saying, well, you know, those drones, they're a good alternative to war as if they were some alternative to war. And that's why I think it's so important for us to concentrate on this particular weapon and how it's being used, because it's being used to trick the American people to think we are getting out of these wars uh, and instead allows us to continue to be at war and expand those wars. Because as Zora showed, I mean, we're not at war, one says, with Pakistan, right? I mean, we're supposedly allies with the Pakistani government, yet we don't give a damn what the Pakistani government says. They can say till they're blue in the face, we don't want you to use these drones, and we say, too bad, we're going to use them. And the U.S. is doing that everywhere. So we're using them now in Yemen. There have been more uh, drone strikes in Yemen in the past two months and even in Pakistan, using them in Somalia. And who knows where else we are using drones. We have reports right now that they, there was a drone attack uh, in the Philippines last month. But these are secret programs. They're not even run by our military. Most of them are run by the CIA, as well as with private contractors that involved, are involved in this. So this is very scary, the way the U.S. is really pulling the wool over the eyes of the American American people under constitutional lawyer Barack Obama, and how we are causing this huge proliferation in spying and killing with this new technology. It's not just the United States that has drones. What's the number two producer and user of drones? Israel. And that's important to understand the relationship. In fact, the Predator and Reaper drones that we are using uh, in Pakistan and elsewhere were developed by an Israeli engineer working for the Israeli uh, military and came over to the United States to perfect the, perfect the drone and sell it to the U.S. military and then the CIA. Um, the Israelis are uh, not only producing drones, they are selling them all over the place, and they don't have the same restrictions that drone producers in the U.S. have about where they can sell them. And what's the number three producer of drones? You'll have to buy this book. 
<laughs> it's called drone warfare because we have a, a quite a long chapter about who's producing the drones and, and who is consuming these drones and who are the victims of the drones. And the number three producer is China. And China is going all out with these drones right now. And China has no restrictions on where they can sell these drones. So there's over 50 countries right now that have drones. Now, they say they're using them for spying. Do you believe that they can't just strap on some missiles and use them for killing as well? It's a very simple technology to turn a spy drone into a killer drone. And it's a very, it's a sophisticated technology on the one hand, but it's not sophisticated compared to a nuclear bomb. And these drones are crashing all over the place. So our supposed enemies are getting lots of ability to copy our drones because they're falling down in their skies. Um, we, we saw what happened in the case of Iran when they say they took down one of the drones and the U.S. was like, oops, you know. Um, but that's happening all over the place because one of the things they don't talk about is how many of these drones crash. In fact, um, one of the places where we are stationing the drones is in the islands in the, in the Seychelles. And they just said, whoa, put a stop to that program. Let's see, why are all these drones crashing? Um, we got a, a, a letter from some friends in Australia yesterday, and they said, all of a sudden, you know, we have a, a very strong peace movement in Australia. We turn around, and all of a sudden we find not only are U.S. military coming to Australia, but they're taking these islands of ours called the Cocos Islands, and they're tr turning it into a base for drones. How did that happen? So this is just spreading in a very uh, uh, dangerous uh, fashion. Um, I like to talk about the golden rule when it comes to international relations and always say, what if? So when we hear about what the U.S. is doing and people try to justify it, we say, what if somebody else was doing this? So Zora talked about the, um, the uh, destruction of international law when it comes to the use of drones. And the U.S. has basically said, we can kill anybody anywhere that we think is an imminent threat to us, and we're going to define what that imminent threat is all about, and this is part of our self-defense. So I don't know if you've ever heard of somebody named Luis Posada Carriles. He's a terrorist. He's a known terrorist, and he's been living in Miami. And, you know, part of the justification for using drones in other people's countries is they won't comply with the law and bring these people to justice. So we have been letting a known terrorist who is known to have downed a Cuban plane back in 76, has never been brought to justice, let him live the good life in Miami. Why shouldn't the Cubans get a drone and just drop it on his condo in Miami? What about the Chinese who think they are at war with the Uyghurs? And uh, there are Uyghurs living here in the United States. What if they decide, okay, we're just going to come to a flat here in Brooklyn and drop one of these drones on them? Would we allow it to happen? And it's come out recently that, of course, we have been using spy planes in Iran all this time. I mean, what if the Iranians were using drones to spy on us here in the United States? Would we allow it to happen? That's American exceptionalism. It's might, make right, might makes right. It's racism. And this is part of the empire that thinks it can do whatever it damn well wants and translates to us that they are doing it in the name of our security and all the while they are making us less and less secure because every time they use a drone to kill anybody that they even call a militant or they say, oops, it was a civilian in the wrong place in the wrong time, they are creating more enemies towards the United States and they are keeping the cycle of violence going and the only ones who are really benefiting benefiting from the cycle of violence is the producers of these weapons, the 1%, the corporations that are now addicted to war. And of course, as part of their addict addiction, they are buying off our Congress. And I think it's so great that Nick and the groups that are they're going out there are focusing on the members of the Congress that are part of something, just to even say it sounds so disgusting to me. I mean, they are part of a drone caucus. Why should we have a drone caucus in Congress? I mean, I can see a caucus to say we need more preschool for the kids that don't get a chance to go to preschool. We need a 
caucus that's going to look out for uh, how we're going to make sure that we don't have clinics all over this country that are closing down. Uh, we need a caucus for all kinds of things that we the people need, and since we're elected by we the people, those are the caucuses that we should have. Instead, they have a caucus to say, how are we going to spread the proliferation of drones abroad and at home. And I know one of our other speakers is going to talk about it at home, but let's remember these two things are linked. And so these members of the Drone Caucus, I mean, you can just do a straight correlation between how much money they are getting from drone producers and how vociferous they are in our Congress to say yes to the drones. And not only are they in the Drone Caucus, they bring the drones to the nation's capital. They bring the drones to the nation's capital. They have a fair every year where they put these monstrosities on display in the lobbies, in the galleries of the U.S. Capitol, and everybody can come by and marvel at this wonderful technology. Well, um, I, along with some friends, didn't feel like we should marvel at that technology, and so when they had the drone uh, display the last time, we went in there and um, we did a die-in. We started screaming and moaning on the ground and saying, help, help, and we had signs that saying Afghanistan, Pakistan, Som Somalia, Yemen, and we were saying, please, please, don't kill us, don't kill us. And of course, the police came in to uh, kick us out so that the drone show could go on unencumbered by any moaning from a symbolic uh, die-in of the people who are the victims of these drones. So um, I wanted to end with just a couple of little quotes from the book. And I hope you'll buy the book. It just came out like two days ago. And um, I'm very excited that we had it in time for this gathering and look forward to going around the country and trying to educate more people about the drones. Um, one is a quote from a Pakistani photographer that we tried to get in the country for the drone summit uh, at the end of April. Um, we were told we would never get him in. We are trying to get in the uh, lawyer who is the lawyer for the drone victims. And uh, so far, the Pentagon, the uh, the U.S. government is refusing to give him a visa. The photographer name is Noor Behram, just to give you a sense of what he finds as he risks his life going around in North Waziristan trying to take photographs of the drone strikes. He says there are just pieces of flesh lying around after a strike. You can't find bodies, so the locals pick up the flesh and they curse America. They say America is killing us inside our own country, inside our own homes, and only because we are Muslims. That is the way many people in Pakistan and around the world feel. And of course, it doesn't create a lot of sympathy towards the United States. On the other hand, if you happen to pick up a, the Wall Street Journal, you might find an editorial that said, never before in the history of warfare with the use of drones have we been able to distinguish as well between combatants and civilians. And my final quote I want to do is um, perhaps my favorite response to Eric Holder. Um, you know, the U.S. has not admitted that we even have a drone program uh, that's run by the CIA because it's a secret program. And so Eric Holder finally was forced to say something about it, but this was only in March of, uh, of 2012 when he was speaking to a bunch of law students at Northwestern University and tried to uh, justify these, this use of, of drones and justify it not only for killing uh, other people's citizens, but for killing our own citizens. And he said, well, you know, the Constitution does not guarantee its citizens the right to judicial process, but only to due process. So Stephen Colbert thought that was great, and he says, yes, the founders weren't picky. Trial by jury, trial by fire, rock, paper, scissors, who cares? Due process, it just means it's a process that you do. <laughs> and the current process is that the president meets with his advisors, they decide who to kill, and then they kill them. If we're going to win our never-ending war against terror, there are bound to be casualties, Colbert, Colbert side, and one of them just happens to be the U.S. Constitution. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I think that uh, your uh, sense of outrage that there would be a, a group of uh, Congress people to become salesmen for this is, uh, is you know, very well placed. And of course, Congressman Ed Towns uh, from Brooklyn is one of those uh, salespersons. Um, what you should also know is that there is an association for drone manufacturers, uh, the same way that there's a Chamber of Commerce, the lawnmower makers have their own association. This particular association put out a PowerPoint display this last August, and they listed some of the obstacles to making more money from drones. And one of the obstacles was civil liberties. And, and it's listed right in their uh, PowerPoint presentation, which means that there will be millions of dollars devoted to persuading you that you don't really need to have any rights of privacy or any civil liberties. And uh, this is our environment now. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, Glenn Ford very much for uh, coming today. Glenn is the... Uh, uh, executive director and uh, principal author for the Black Agenda Report. And uh, in this uh, array of commentary about the Obama administration, about what's happening around the world, Glenn is particularly clear in uh, his understanding that uh, regardless of the, uh, the race of the president, there are certain standards that we have to uh, look for and, and, uh, and demand. And uh, he's a very uh, uh, clear and a voice, a voice of integrity. And we want to thank you for coming up here. Uh, thank you. And I can only keep myself clear by having a script. So bear with me, OK? Uh, power to the people. Power to the people of the world. Because the people of the world are going to need it. And they're going to need it because this government, this administration, the man that most of you voted for in the last election, has declared war in a real sense uh, on the people of the world collectively, including the inhabitants of the United States. He is methodically waging war against peace and against every instrument that humankind has devised over the centuries in an attempt to keep the peace. Now, why am I sounding so apocalyptic? I'm doing that because I really feel that this is the case, because Obama has declared war against international law. He's declared war against the very concept of national sovereignty as we have come to know it over the centuries. He's served notice that no nation on the planet is safe and that every person on the planet Earth is fair game for his killing machines. This president has crossed an historical Rubicon. He is trying now to pull the world with him into this terrifying darkness. And nobody should be surprised that he has done this because Obama told you that he was going to do it. This was no secret. If you didn't hear it, it's because you didn't want to hear it. He announced back on the campaign trail that he was going to unleash the drones. In fact, he promised you that he was going to unleash the drones in, in amazing numbers. And that was a promise that Obama has kept. He instructed all of his surrogates during that campaign to explain to you in detail on talk shows and in constant uh, sessions with reporters uh, that his war, his war in Afghanistan and in Pakistan would be a smart war, a drone war, not a dumb war like George Bush's war. And many of you bought into that. You thought of that as somehow a lesser evil. He told you that drone warfare would be cheaper and that it would be more efficient and that it would save lives, that it would save American lives, it would save Pakistani lives, and it would save Afghani lives. And in that euphoria of that phony peace campaign,
Many people swallowed that poison pill of drone warfare. And doing that, they were also swallowing the collapse of the international order that inevitably goes with unleashing the drones. Barack Obama took uh, his election day victory as a mandate to start waging these famously smart wars, these drone wars. He has now elevated to a strategic principle the notion that the United States is uniquely entitled to use whatever technical means is at its disposal to target and kill whoever it chooses, any place that it chooses, any time that it chooses, and that it will be accountable only to in itself. That is a total repudiation of international law. That is not just breaking international law, that is repudiating it. Understand, we're not talking about some episodic breach of, of international law by the United States, some episodic violation. Uh, the United States breaks international law all the time. It always has, and its partners do too. It does that as a matter of convenience. But this is something very different, and I can't emphasize that enough. This repudiation of international law, as we have come to understand international law, and it's really not that difficult, is a repudiation of the fundamental universal principles of the sovereignty of nations, the way the world has been set up over hundreds and hundreds of years. Most importantly, even more important than that, this declaration, and it's a declaration really of lawlessness, is now central to the U.S. military's strategy and its philosophy of war and war and peace. It is at the core of U.S. plans to dominate the world militarily. And now it is the guiding force in American relations with the rest of the world. You can't separate relations uh, at, uh, during times of war or when in a state of belligerence from relations with nations in times of peace, because war is always a threat to the relations that you have at times of peace. We make the rules, is what Obama has told the rest of the world. And he says that the old rules, meaning international law, do not apply. He says that we will take out individuals and countries as we see fit, not just covertly, like in the good old days, but in the clear light of day. And we will do that as a matter of policy. Not 007, not James Bond, but as a matter of policy. We will assemble, and this is part of the new uh, strategy, we will assemble coalitions based on our strategic ambitions. And we will tell other countries that they can either join those ad hoc coalitions or they can risk winding up being on the other end of our extraordinary technical firepower and, of course, our drones. That is the current state of international law as recognized or imposed by the United States. U.S. planning for future relations among nations is now based on tools of war, and by that I mean the drones and also the special operations forces whose full deployment, whose full exploitation by the United States requires that we have a world without international law. It is a necessity to have that kind of framework in order for the United States to use the weapons uh, that it has spent all these billions of dollars for. This requires the eradication of due process of law as an organizing principle of relations between peoples and among peoples. I'm going to repeat this. U.S. strategy requires that due process of law be thrown into the waste bin of history. Drone warfare kills suspects without trial. It kills them without charge. 
and without the possibility of surrender. It is proper to call that kind of activity terror. But what is even more profoundly terrifying about it is that it utterly destroys the concept of due process. And without due process, there is no rule of law. Thus, in the United States crusade to make the entire world into a kind of free fire zone, it is succeeding in turning the world into a no law zone as well. A world without due process and without law. And that logic must include the United States. And if you thought it wouldn't, you were quite naive. So those of you who voted for Obama and his utterly lawless but very, very smart drone warfare program should understand that this is what paved the way for the abolition of due process right here at home. One follows inexorably after the other. They are inseparable. And it's not as if Obama didn't give us a heads up on that too. Shortly after assuming office, he was telling reporters, well, of course, there must be some form of preventive detention. He said it quite frequently. And what he meant was, of course, our foreign policy to abolish the rule of law, the rule of law and due process is a global foreign policy. And so it applies to the United States just like everywhere else. So Obama gave us fair warning that he would soon be shaping a preventive detention bill. And he was, once again, true to his word. Sometimes he is. Most people who call themselves progressive simply refuse to hear him when he told us what was coming down the hopper. When the deed was done, and when that bill was signed on New Year's Eve, we still heard some people quibbling about whether this brave new world would expose the citizenry to imprisonment without trial and without charge under military or under civilian auspices. And personally, I, I really don't see the difference. I do not understand that argument. If due process is a dead letter, then there is no rule of law, period. I would think, in fact, that if you put the Star Chamber under military control, that at least would give, give it an aura of being temporary, something that uh, is only fit for this particular emergency or occasion or whatever excuse they wanted to concoct. Whereas if it's under civilian control, uh, it's here forever and forever in a day. It never will go away. But I, I'm going to let daughters, uh, my daughter and other lawyers uh, argue and quibble about that. I think the ultimate truth is either due process is an inherent human right or it isn't. And since New Year's Eve in the United States, it isn't. We've already lost our constitutional protections. They flew away on a drone and Obama was on the joystick. And the U.S. is now a law-free zone by statute. And any president any president, he or she, can activate these draconian powers at their convenience. Out there in the rest of the world, the U.S. Imperial Offensive is in full swing. After all, that's the whole purpose for this preventive detention law at home. It's the whole purpose for making the entire planet, including the United States, a no-law zone. The United States has superimposed its own rules of conduct in place of international law. Uh, those rules are embodied under the, uh, I think it's a slogan rather than a doctrine, of, but the doctrine, okay, of humanitarian military intervention. And that means whatever President Obama says it means. Humanitarian intervention in practice strips nations of sovereignty just as quickly as a drone erases the life of its victims. And you don't even have to be a belligerent. You don't have to get in the way of the United States with guns in hand uh, to become a victim of humanitarian military intervention. All you have to do is ask Haiti. Haiti was stripped naked to the world without an ounce of sovereignty in practical effect. And it was one of the first 
victims of humanitarian intervention. That was under George Bush. But this man, Obama, has got it down to a diabolical science. If you support or if you are ambivalent about U.S. intervention in Syria or in Iran, then you have bought into Obama's world without laws. It is a world of raw force. It is a world of barbarianism. So if you've ever wondered, and I have, of course, over the decades, if you've ever wondered how imperialism in its late stages is going to go out, it is in convulsions of lawlessness that shake the foundations of civilization as we have come to know it. And you, right now, you are a witness to that. Power to the people. And, and I don't like to, but I have to entertain questions. <laughs> we will? So I get a reprieve for a second. Okay. Our next speaker um, is a uh, vice chair of uh, Brooklyn for Peace. Um, David Tykulsker is going to uh, talk to us uh, about some of the uh, political uh, implications of uh, what we're hearing here today. David? Uh, thank you. Let me start off with a few announcements um, because I am with Brooklyn for Peace and we want you to be active. Uh, for peace, we know many of you are. First, um, Tax Day, Tuesday, April 17th, um, we are uh, joining with our friends in Bay Ridge uh, at the Fort Hamilton Post Office to suggest that there may be useful alternatives um, to spending uh, the billions that we spend for the military. On April 22nd at Barbez on 6th Avenue and 9th Street in Park Slope, uh, at 4.30 we will be sponsoring uh, a book discussion about the passion of Bradley Manning, a uh, gentleman who should win the Nobel Peace Prize for his uh, activities. And then our Peace Fair will be on April 28th uh, at Brooklyn College, and we hope you'll come join us for that all-day event um, in which we'll be discussing many different aspects of what a useful peace movement can be. Um, since I'm talking among friends, I figure my job here is to be mildly entertaining and reasonably provocative, so I'm going to try to do that, um, first by boring you. Um, I will start off by saying, when I was asked to think about drones, what got to me was not the fact that they can kill people, but that they're about seeing everything. The whole point of a drone is to see everything that's going on on the, on the ground, and that the seer is unseen, and actually is controlling the whole situation. Uh, that has historical resonances, at least for me. Uh, it reminded me of an English philosopher, a great English philosopher of capitalism, named Jeremy Bentham. Uh, Jeremy Bentham was the divisor of something called the panopticon, which means the all-seeing thing. It was supposed to be this super-duper prison in which one person could see the entire facility. But Mr. Bentham's ambitions were not limited to prisons. Um, he created something he called the inspection principle, um, and I think you might find it interesting. And let me read you from a letter of his from 1787, and we'll then talk about how it fits into drones. He says, to say all in one word, it will be found applicable, I think, without exception to all establishments whatsoever in which, within a space not too large to be commanded by buildings, a number of persons is meant to be kept under inspection, no matter how different or even opposite the purpose, whether that be of punishing the incorrigible, guarding the insane, reforming the vicious, confining the suspected, employing the idle, maintaining the helpless, curing the sick, instructing the willing in any branch of industry, or training the rising race in the path of education. In a word, whether it be applied to the purposes of perpetual prisons in the room of death, 
or prisons for confinement before trial or penitentiary houses or houses of correction or workhouses or manufactories or madhouses or hospitals or schools. It is obvious that in all these instances, the more constantly the persons to be inspected are under the eyes of the person who should inspect them, the more perfectly will the purpose X of the establishment have been attained. Let me repeat that sentence because I think that is really crucial to understanding what all of this is about. And I mean all of this. It is obvious that in all these instances, the more constantly the persons to be inspected are under the eyes of the person who should inspect them, the more perfectly will the purpose X of the establishment have been attained. Ideal perfection, if that were the object, would require that each person should actually be in that predicament during every instant of time. This being impossible, or maybe it isn't with drones, the next thing to be wished for is that in every instant, seeing reason to believe as much and not being able to satisfy himself to the contrary, he should conceive himself to be so. Jeremy Bentham in 1787. So let me say, it struck me in reading this that all subaltern peoples, to use a phrase of the day, are a combination of incorrigible, insane, vicious, suspected, idle, helpless, sick, the willing or the rising race in need of education. That's the way the ruling order sees them, quite literally, and in some combination all the time. Well, then how do we apply this principle to empire outside of limited buildings? We start with a compliant government, preferably with a formal democracy, but if not, say, in Egypt or other places, so be it. Um, problem is that things get out of hand, right? The people tend to uh, revolt and the persons to be inspected rebel. So under the eyes of the persons who should inspect them, the first line of attack is always a local government, often with the aid of such actors as uh, semi-governmental actors. We had a few of those in Central America during the 1980s, right? Certain death squads. Um, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the paramilitaries in Colombia today. Um, and of course, we occasionally have to engage in our own rather prophylactic measures such as an assassination, like Lumumba in Africa, or Osama bin Laden when needed. And with regard to the assassination aspect of this, of course, you need usually a team from the CIA or the Navy SEALs. But as with every human enterprise, there's an opportunity to go wrong. Right? And we've seen this even with the best assassination teams historically. So, when the Israeli Mossad tried to assassinate Khalid Mashal, who was the head of Hamas uh, back in 1998, um, they found him on a street in, um, in uh, Jordan, and they injected him with a lethal toxin. Uh, unfortunately for the Israelis, they were caught. Um, King Hussein said to uh, the Israelis, you better give us the toxin right away. The Israelis said no. Hussein called President Clinton and said, you better give him the toxin right away. And a guy named Benjamin Netanyahu coughed up the toxin. Human enterprise can go wrong. And as we know, when the government and the people get together and rebel, the eyes of the persons who should inspect them comes in the form of an army of occupation. And we've seen this even when somebody like George Bush knows better. Now, with an army, there's always a, a problem because it is a human enterprise. Um, and we know this from studies back in World War II. There was a gentleman named S.L.A. Marshall 
who found that less than 25% of the soldiers in World War II actually fired their guns. That's the American army in World War II. This is you know, the largest army we had, the most successful military. Um, his view was that less than 25% fired their guns. So American military doctrine for the last 70 years has been largely devoted to dealing with that problem. That's a big part of what basic training is all about. Um, and uh, it's a, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about whether those statistics actually hold um, in general. But what is the ultimate dream here? And the answer is we solved the problem with the army of occupation. We solved the problem of soldiers not firing with magic machines, video games. You get the picture. The persons who inspect them, the persons who should inspect them, to use uh, Bentham's phrase, who are these people? Now, historically, these people are professionals, right? That's who has become the keepers of the prisons, the keepers in the hospitals, keepers in education. Those are professionals. And the public has been removed from both participation and as Foucault points out, the actual, uh, any decision making about the process of punishing the incorrigible or guarding the insane or reforming the vicious, confining the suspected, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as we know um, from our own experience here in New York, the arc of capitalism is that essentially all of these functions sooner or later get privatized. Right? That's what's going on in our city right now, and that's what's going on with our prisons. We have prisons that are being privatized. We have education that is being privatized in the form of charter schools. Across the board, all of these professionalized functions not only become removed from the public, but they become part of the corporate domain. That is the arc of where things have gone. And the same arc is true with the military, right? With regard to both the observed and the observers. And we have seen that there is a career military now. We have ended public participation in the military by not having a draft. We used to have a draft. We have now in Afghanistan more contractors than we have troops. We have more contractors dying than we have troops dying. To quote the New York Times, even the dying has been outsourced. That's true for Americans, but of course it is not true for the Afghanis. So I think of drones as being emblematic of this private and privatized war making. With drones, you don't have a need for anything public. There's no need for an army with drones. There's no need for a Navy SEALs team with drones. You can outsource a drone to a call center. You can, uh, sorry, make that a video game center. And you can make it cheaper and therefore more profitable by sending it out to a center in, I don't know, Mumbai, Johannesburg fill in the blank. That's where this is going. So the question I would ask is, is why as peace activists should we be concerned? I mean, with due respect to the previous speaker, we've had plenty of instances where the United States government has overtly come and toppled governments that we didn't like. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the Dominican Republic in 1965, right? There, I mean, there are any, you know, we can go through go through the history of Latin and Central America. We, we took over governments overtly with impunity. We just have expanded the field in which we're doing this. You know, I, I mean, at this point, it's, you know, we've had an unchallengeable military industrial complex in this country for, you know, at least since the Eisenhower administration, as he pointed out. And corporate feeding at the you know, public trough over war making goes back at least to the Civil War. I mean, let's, that's where Morgan, for instance, made his fortune, right? It was bad horses going to the, mil to, the, to the Union military. 
And if you want to be optimistic, you can always take the position that technology will never solve any of the war-making problems. It never does. I mean, we've seen this idea that somehow technology is going to solve you know, the problems of war-making in the past. It was called bombing. Right? That's what bombing was. It was supposed to be the thing that would obviate the need to actually send troops on the, into the ground. Well, that never has worked, as we know. And surgical bombing has never been surgical, except in the sense of, you know, causing blood to flow. And, you know, as we sit here now, we can take comfort from the probability that sooner rather than later, there's going to be technology that will be developed and be deployed that will be able to disrupt the actual, you know, deployment of drones. And whether that's going to come from China or anonymous or, you know, somebody else, you, you know, you can, as it were, be comforted if you want by, you know, the realization that it is probable um, that we are not going to, you know, have, what should I say, the impunity that drones have, you know, given the military and the private contractors uh, forever. Um, but I do think that there's, there is something here that is worth worrying about, and that's this whole corporatization and privatization of war making. Um, this culture used to find um, war profiteering reprehensible. Um, a guy named Truman uh, made his political reputation uh, during World War II, um, pointing out how terrible it was uh, that certain companies were actually making profits uh, off the military. That is completely beyond the pale of discussion at this point, and we need to start to think about how to go back to those halcyon days of World War II, um, when it was actually considered a bad thing to be a weapon, a munitions maker, and a war profiteer. Um, I also think that there's a real difference between a, a public bureaucracy, which is essentially conservative, as Max Weber pointed out, and a private corporation, which is essentially a vampire. Um, it has to grow or it dies. It has to suck the blood of increasing profit or it dies. And especially in a system like we have, where we have one dollar, one vote, um, you're gonna, it seems to me that we are stuck with a, if as the corporatization of war increases, the endlessness of war will increase as well. Those go hand in hand. Um, and we need to be, as a peace movement, pretty critical about what we've done and how we've been doing it. And I speak about, you know, someone who has been active in this for a good while. Um, we, for instance, cooperated with ending the draft. And I think that we have to own up to the fact that that was a terrible mistake that we made. Um, we have let the Vietnam, we let um, Lyndon and Dickey um, fund the Vietnam War essentially without any tax increases, which meant that people did not, once the troops came home, people did not feel that war. And we have let our leaders for the last 20 years fund all of the endless wars essentially by borrowing the money um, and making our kids pay for it. It's, it's a terrible uh, mistake that we have made and we've been too silent about the essential privatization of all the military functions. And I think that we've got to you know, own up that we have been wrong um, about this and it's time for us to 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 change. And I think that um, we need to, if we're going to build a majority movement to turn this around, um, we should be explicit about a few things. Um, first is the right not to be surveilled. We need to be very clear that this is a basic human right that the government, neither governments nor corporations have. Um, and that's true for the people in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, it's true for us in the United States. Um, it's true when we go into work and our employers are looking on our computers um, all the time. It's true when Google is looking at every move we make, however we make it. Um, and it's true with the New York City police when they stop and frisk young men of color. All of this, it seems to me, is part of, a, 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 uh, of the panopticon that Bentham was talking about and that is in place in various aspects in our society. Um, second, we need to be fiscally responsible. Um, not just because we have kids and they're going to have to pay for these stupid wars um, that we have been borrowing against, but I think we want to start talking about things like make taxes on cell phones 
or taxes on internet uses as a way of funding um, these wars rather than making our kids pay for them. Um, and I think that we, ought to, we have to have a discussion in the peace movement about reinstituting the draft, what it means for employment, um, and uh, how we can make the military actually subject to democracy. Um, it's interesting that drones have prompted this, but I think that we are at a, as I think all the speakers have indicated, a pretty desperate time um, in our democracy, and I think it is uh, really thanks to Nick um, and to, to Nadia for your wonderful work in uh, raising these very important issues at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, and I, th I think it raises some questions, too, about whether we need to be calling for uh, a prohibition against lobbying by arms makers, um, whether anyone who's the head of an arms industry should make more than a dollar a year, uh, whether arms makers should be making uh, campaign contributions. So uh, thank you. Um, our final speaker, and um, uh, I would say um, one of the hardest uh, working uh, anti-war uh, persons in uh, show business is uh, Deborah Sweet. And uh, she uh, has that very uh, dangerous uh, quality of doing what she says she's going to do and uh, encouraging other people who work with her to do the same thing. Um, Deborah has been uh, very much at the forefront of reminding America that uh, torture uh, has gone on, is going on, and uh, that uh, this uh, very uh, discomforting uh, illegality that uh, Glenn Ford was talking about, other people talking about, uh, profoundly affects uh, people's lives every single day uh, who have uh, been found to be on the wrong side of uh, the ambitions of uh, our leaders. So uh, I want to thank Deborah and uh, Please welcome her. Okay, well, this is not a roast of Nick Modern, but I have to thank you, too. And um, about two years ago, Nick just about got us all killed in Greenwich, Connecticut. He called a protest with the prototype of this, and we went to this gated community in Greenwich where one of the drone makers, the CEOs of the drone companies lived. And we were having a, you know, it was a good protest, but then one of them comes out and threatens to kill us, to drive over us, if we're protesting on the streets of Greenwich. And that was my first outing with Nick and the drone protests, and I thought, I think this guy's on to something. Right? If you could, if you could get that kind of a, a reaction in Greenwich, Connecticut. But I also have to say that we've gotten a very significant reaction in Brooklyn, New York over the last three days. And I just really want to thank Jane and Nick and everybody that brought the drones out, um, to Trader Joe's and to the green markets. I learned a lot and I have been doing this for a while about interacting with people and what these drones bring out. So thank you. Thank you for Brooklyn for Peace. Thank you especially Nick. Nick has built nine, nine? Well, okay, he's built a dozen of these things. And um, you can get your own for $350. And I really encourage doing that. Um, if this is the wave and the war of the future, we have to be finding the ways of engaging with people about what these drones mean. So I'm serious about that. NoDrones.com. He's funded a lot of it personally. That shouldn't need to be the case. I hope there's going to be a hat passed for Nick and the drone project. Hol All right? All right, Kwame. You, you pass your hat and I'll kick some in. Um, I want to really thank Medea for all the work that's gone into this book. I'm just getting my copy today. I will be at the Drone Summit in two weeks. And I think 
we might be able to start catching up with the huge amount of media that the drone has gotten in the last three or four months. I don't know how much you all are paying attention, but having worked on this issue for the last several years, it is astonishing that every single day, if you set a Google alert, you're going to get dozens of articles now about the U.S. drone programs. They are secret. They're the CIA and the military. There is no oversight. They do have their own caucus because the poor drones otherwise, who would be looking out for their interests without the drone caucus? Representative Adolphus Towns. I want to really thank Glenn Ford because um, besides stealing half of my speech, most importantly, Glenn was one of the people that was saying this in 2008 when Obama was running, when so many people in the peace movement, so many people in the peace movement were putting money into hope that was, we knew was not going to bring change. And I was tweeting madly all the things you were saying, Glenn, and I'm really going to take that to heart about the fundamental change that Obama has brought. It's extremely important to be saying that truth. I really thank Zora for um, speaking and opening up the whole concept of what are the people that are under these drones suffering. This is something that is not in our media. I'm sorry, but the New York Times goes along every single day with the Defense Department. Everyone killed by a drone is what? By definition, an insurgent or a militant. Just because they were killed by the U.S. drone program. That's what they are called. And of course, Obama has the nerve to say, no civilians have been killed by drones. How would he know that? You know, for a system that cares nothing about the people in Pakistan, and I heard Zora talk about this the last time we did a panel, during the time the terrible floods came in Pakistan was the only time the U.S. drone program was put a little bit, was, was pulled back a little bit. And it was only so they could save the drones from the flooding, not because they could help the people in Pakistan. This is the kind of bloodthirsty system that is carrying out this drone program in secret. And it is our responsibility to pull the blinds off of it. This is why it's important to be out on the streets in this way. And I really feel that an essential part of what we need to do um, is to go out among the public and take on the, the questions that we got over the last few days and the last few years related to people's feeling that the drones are making us safer. The drones are making us safer. Us that live in this country are safer because these drones are operating. Uh, yesterday in front of Trader Joe's I had a, a crew of five boys and I think that that they, they said they were Palestinian, which of course means they didn't live in Palestine. Maybe the grandfather or the great-grandfather did. They were 12 and 13 years old. They had relatives in Syria and Lebanon and, and the whole diaspora. But they were fascinated by the drones at first. They really wanted to, to know how the drones worked and what did that mean? Were those weapons on the drone? And what did that mean that that the drone was able to do. So I said, okay, I'm going to tell you how this works and you're not going to want to hear this. It looks really cool. It looks like a video game. It looks like it would be fun. But do you know that the pilots of these drones that are in some trailer in Creech Air Force Base or up in Syracuse, New York or wherever they are, they have a nickname for the people that are killed by drones, and that nickname is Squirter. Jane Mayer wrote about this in 2009, the first time I really be began to take U.S. drone warfare, 
warfare seriously, and she described having interviewed drone pilots that the nickname of the, of the people they were targeting after they were shot was squirters. As Medea talked about, there's nothing much to pick up but pieces. These are human beings. These are hundreds, probably thousands of human beings. Is it worse to be killed by a drone or a nuclear attack? Or is it worse, worse to be shot by US military and then urinated on? It's all bad. It's all illegitimate, immoral, and unjust. The US drone war is an extension of fundamentally illegitimate domination and wars for domination by our government. The biggest, best armed, historically largest empire in world history that is unchained and unchallengeable unless we do it. That's the role of ourselves on this gorgeous Saturday afternoon when we know drones are flying on the other end of the world and, and soon to be flying here. I really think we also have a battle within the anti-war movement to grapple with the fact that, um, you know, it, and we should talk about it here, I don't think that it's U.S. corporations that are driving the drone war. I can see that they're massively profiting from them. This is, this is a cakewalk right now. The number of U.S. corporations going in to build the components of these drones, the fact that there's no oversight, and the fact that they're, um, the U.S. military alone is increasing the number of drones, something like by a factor of 10 within the next couple of years. This is a growing business, but it is not Grumman it's not all of these companies that are driving the war because they're going to make money off of it. There's a bigger system at play here. There is an imperialist system which is looking to dominate and control the whole globe. This is what we have to grapple with. This is a huge factor in driving these wars, controlling the economies and exploiting billions of people. And we just have to be prepared to go there with people and look at that. Yes, the whole system does need to be changed. And a big part of it is if we could get a situation in this country where people here would say, we're not going to go along with it. Having the lawyers, and I know we have some lawyers here today, lay out the laws, having the activists like Glenn and David and Medea and Zora do the exposure about what's going on and having people like Nick put his life on hold for a while and take this no drones tour around the country are extremely important and what we most need is mass resistance against these wars. We really do need people in the streets and I wanted to end on the note that people always say, okay, Miss Deborah, what is it we can do? There are a list of things that I think people can do. I plan to promote what Brooklyn for Peace did the last three days all over the country if I can. And I'm sure my sisters and brothers working in this movement will help. This is a hell of an important way to go out and do outreach and to bring forward. How many of you all did see the drones in Brooklyn in the last three days? That's a good percentage of the crowd. And if you haven't, imagine this in front of Trader Joe's at the corner of Court and Atlantic um, multiplied by three and the number of people that stopped to talk about it. This is important. We don't have napalm to show people. We don't have a nuclear weapon to show people. We don't have M1 tanks we can take out on the street. But the man's technology has provided us with something that we can take out and show people. 
This is the killing that's being done in your name. Regularly at Creech Air Force Base and at Hancock Air Force Base, which is up in Syracuse, some of us will be there next weekend, there are protests at the Air Force bases where some of these drone programs are carried out. This is important mass resistance. Next month, in Chicago, NATO is coming. The first NATO meetings for quite some time in the United States in Obama's hometown, Chicago. People are coming. There's been a call put out by the Occupy movement and others to get ourselves to NATO and protest. I plan, and I'm going to ask everyone for help, to bring these drone models to Chicago and do this outreach among people who live in Chicago who have been propagandized so heavily about how wonderful it is that NATO, that example of international cooperation, is coming to our city. Hell no! Humanitarian intervention by NATO, Yugoslavia, Libya, maybe Syria, Iran, Afghanistan. These are war criminals. Yes, led by the U.S. and the old colonial powers of Europe. But NATO is no good. So we, we really want to call people to come, especially on the 20th and 21st of May to Chicago to protest NATO. And if you can't come, please kick in to help other people get there. The Occupy movement is over in Central Park right now talking about the Spring Awakening. And part of that discussion going on is how to get people out to Chicago to protest NATO. And just one more note. When I hear the word we, we are doing this. It may be the government we live under that's doing it, but I always separate myself I never feel when the U.S. government is doing something that it's I doing it, that it's we doing it. The government of this country has completely separate interests from the people, especially the people of the world. And I'll leave you with one idea and note that World Can't Wait has developed this year. Besides talking about stopping the crimes of our government, no matter who commits them, we're spreading the message that humanity and the planet come first. Humanity and the planet come first. In 10 languages, we're going to be in Chicago at the NATO protests. In Urdu, in Bari, in Arabic, in Farsi, in German, in Serbian, in Spanish, and French. Humanity and the planet come first. I thank you very much for doing this program, and especially Nick. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think Kwame passed the hat for the tour, but we're also going to pass the hat, uh, have a love offering for the uh, people of this church. Uh, they've been very kind to welcome us, and... Uh, uh, they do really fine work here, so if we can uh, pass the hat again uh, for uh, contribution to the church, I think they would very much appreciate that. Um, uh, I, I'd like to ask the speakers to come up uh, and uh, sit up front so that they can see their, uh, their questioners, um, and uh, uh, you'll, be, you'll be first. Um. And uh, let's give them uh, another round of applause. Wonderful presentation today. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Mike, you had a, a question?
Yes, please. And the usage of surveillance drones on the U.S.-Mexican border has become uh, more profitable than anything else that's going on in the Southwest. On Thursday evening, we will have a conversation uh, sponsored by the Latin American Committee of Brooklyn for Peace about what's going on in, in the border, its relation to immigration issues, its relation to the profitability of these war um, corporations. So if anybody's interested, I have the And I'd like to hear comments on uh, surveillance use. You've talked a lot about um, the use for bombing. But are there any other specific examples besides the U.S.-Mexico border of how the drones are being used? I mean, the answer is clearly yes. I mean, clearly with regard to various monitoring of demonstrations, for instance, in London. I mean, you can go on YouTube and watch, you know, the drone uh, videos of various protests that have gone on in London. I mean, it is. I, I, this is clearly the wave of the future. Is this, you know, I, I didn't pick the panopticon, you know, for nothing. It's, it's really this is the goal: is to keep everybody all the time under complete monitoring. So anything that resembles political fill in the blank is going to be monitored, and that's the, the and the drone, you know, the the miniaturization of the drones and the fact that they're able to get into places, you know, fly around and, and get to places makes it much easier to monitor what's going on. I mean, obviously, um, for instance, you know, the Israelis are doing this all over um, Gaza and the West Bank. I mean, that's, it is completely routine at this point um, for there to be dozens and dozens of drones all the time in those airspaces. And there's nothing, of course, the Palestinians at the moment can do about it. Although, I, as I say, I suspect that's going to change soon. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'd like a little more information on how the drones will be used against us as American citizens. I think Medea probably has things in her book. I haven't read it yet. But one of the things that's recently happened is that the Obama administration has seen to it that the Federal Aviation Authority by the year 2015 has to make it possible, has to figure out the rules so that drones can pretty much have access to U.S. airspace of all sizes. This includes, right now there, um, there are prototypes at every level. There are there are prototypes that are about to come online that can be controlled by an iPhone. And this goes along with the U.S. military's warfighting plans now are very much based on training new soldiers through video games and iPhone and iPad technology. So this goes along with how they're going to be training and using that technology in the field. Surveillance specifically is very hard to pin down because as David referred to, corporate um, interests are going to be able to use these drones, right? People are going to be able to buy them. I suppose Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church could buy its own drone after 2015. <clears throat> and surveil Fort Greene Park. We have no clue how far this is going to go, and it is really extremely alarming when you have a government that already feels and does read all of our email, our mail, and our phone conversations. So the government has the privacy, and we don't have any. Um, I should say that um, when this legislation was passed, that would allow the drones in U U.S. airspace. Uh, law enforcement agencies on all levels were part of lobbying for that. And there is drone technology being developed by the Air Force specifically for urban areas 
that is much more of a high definition um, and thoroughgoing radar than what's used for this kind of really primitive uh, eyeball. And they're also developing uh, weapons that are specific for urban areas that have less, they call it, collateral damage. So we have a, a technology that police are using in a limited way now in Houston and other places that they're very eager to get throughout the United States. And so when you magnify the police misconduct and put it through the, you know, the technology of that's, that's less perfect than face-to-face, -face, but gives you the opportunity to get rid of a problem, you can see that this legislation that was passed should have had restrictions on carrying weapons and drones, should have had restrictions on surveillance. This legislation has no restrictions on any of that. These drones under this law can carry weapons and can watch whatever they want. So this is one reason why we're out here now at this moment to try to put a stop to that. We believe there should be an international ban on weaponized drones and on drone surveillance because of what David was saying, this panopticon is a weapon in itself. It creates a virtual prison for people legitimated by this particular law and, and what Glenn is talking about. Are yes, ma'am. I, I, would you want to comment on that? You go ahead. Well, a, a couple of things. Um, there is a section in the book that does talk about some of this. It's all very recent. In fact, the legislation that was passed was February 14th, and it said within 90 days, so we have until May 14th, they have to make the uh, airspace available for small drones. Those are 4.4 pound drones, very small drones that could only go up to 400 feet. That's the beginning. And that's to get people used to seeing drones around and thinking that drones are going to be used for all kinds of good things. Um, then we'll see the bigger drones. And uh, they're talking about like 30,000 drones being in the U.S. skies uh, by 2015. Um, there will still, you will still have to get permission to be using a drone. Who will be getting the permission? It's going to be the police departments. Every police department wants drones. So as I said earlier, while they're all talking about these wonderful humanitarian uses for drones and uses for drones that the, the, um, uh, it, the, the funny thing going around the internet is this taco company that says, uh, we, we, we want to send you your lunch by drone, the, the, uh, um, and UPS wants to use drones and all these people. It's going to be law enforcement that first and foremost has the use of drones. And Zora said to mention that in the, that we have to recognize that drones have already been used to kill U.S. citizens. Um, there is the case of, uh, in Yemen. Uh, of Al-Alaki, Anwar Al-Alaki, it was killed with another American and his son three weeks later. I mean, if we can kill a 16-year-old American born in Denver without an outcry in the, in the United States, why should we think it would be so far out to think about drones killing us here at home? And they are already talking about non-lethal weapons being used by the police department with the drones. So we have a lot to fear about what's going to be coming out of this legislation, uh, not the legislation, how the legislation is going to be translated by the FAA. And I think that's one of the reasons that we called the drone summit at the end of April is to get together and say, okay, what can we do to try to influence this? This before it is enacted in 2015. And what conclusion did you come to about what we can do besides publicity? Well, we haven't had the drone summit yet. That is at the end of April. And I encourage everybody here to come because it's going to be the first time that this wide array of people, we have somebody here. Is, is Peter here? Peter, um, uh, with the group called ICRAC that has a lot of 
uh, members of it that are scientific experts and they tell us if you think what we got now is scary, wait till you see this development of the technology so that you don't even have the human in the loop. You have totally autonomous drones. Um, we have people coming from overseas who have been uh, looking at the uh, issues firsthand of the, of the drone victims. We have people who have been involved in international conventions who are going to talk about how can we move towards an international convention on the use of drones. So this is a plug for those of you who can get yourself down to um, Washington, D.C. Remember, it's a $20 bus ride um, to come and join us because Sunday is totally devoted to a strategy session to think about what we can do. And, and, and so one, one of the things that we, are, we can do is a campaign to get drones out of the hands of the CIA, at least, and that is this petition here that's going around. If you haven't signed it, please do so. Excuse me, Glenn, did you want to comment on that? Not on that. Uh, no, I mean on the, on the police or surveillance part. Or, I, I, I saw you me. raise your hand, but I, okay. Another question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I want to take all the speakers and Just very briefly, there is a company called Atair. They make a kind of parasail drone, which is uh, essentially a glider that has a motor but is uh, operated uh, from the ground, you know, near or far away. Uh, they are used to drop uh, munitions to, into certain places. Uh, but when I called his office, um, I wanted to know why his membership in the drone caucus wasn't mentioned along with his other caucus memberships. And his uh, aide said, well, we don't list all of our caucuses. And I said, well, why is he on it? And she said, well, it's because of this Atair company uh, down in the Navy Yard. Um, and she said, oh, it's because Atair uh, can drop medical supplies to our troops. So there is this constant wish to totally uh, whitewash, sugarcoat, and make palatable some really deadly, devastating behaviors. And uh, Brooklyn for Peace very uh, wisely has created postcards to send to Ed Towns asking him to resign from this uh, drone caucus. And I think they can, you know, hook you up with that. But uh, he definitely deserves to get a lot of phone calls about this, and I, and I thank you for, for uh, bringing that up. Ma'am, you had a question?
show the true face of the man behind the hope curtain. And I just take you off of what Naomi said. I think it is really important that in addition to the activist uh, work that we do, the movement work we do, this wonderful idea of, of showing this drone thing in the community, getting people to be aware of how terrible it is and what's coming down the line, that one of the things we do, in addition, is that we run candidates that are not in the Democratic Party, that are explicitly anti-war, that raise these issues. These are congressional candidates in the areas of Brooklyn, where uh, our Congress people are not speaking up for what we believe, but for what the corporation believe. But we want to say that, you know, as elections go forward, that we think the only way really to challenge this is to be able to run candidates in addition to all the other work that we do. So we invite people to do that. And they're as free or as independent. We are happy to help you work out the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, I was going to wait until everybody had their questions uh, before I t t took uh, the opportunity to uh, disagree with my colleague who disagreed with me about whether anything uh, uh, earth-shaking uh, has happened. I, I think the question shows that some very earth-shaking things have happened. And uh, what the biggest evidence of something earth-shaking having happened is that we have this humanitarian interventionist uh, doctrine, which seeks to be a substitute for international law that allows violations of the sovereignty of nations like Syria, such as that uh, organization is suggesting, uh, the, the camel getting his uh, head under the tent uh, one way or another. Uh, of course, these, these uh, humanitarian uh, drones uh, can turn into uh, uh, deadly zone, uh, drones at any moment, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that they, that regardless of what someone says their mission is, they are violating the, the sovereign rights of a, of a country. That is what has happened here. Uh, and I, I think we could, we could talk about it almost like in terms of, of the Dred Scott decision. Uh, the Dred Scott decision said that the slave has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. Now, if you saw all this as just a straight line, you could say, well, nothing changed with the Dred Scott decision uh, because slaves had been treated as if they had no rights that a white man uh, was bound to respect for hundreds of years. So wh what's all this fuss about the Dred Scott decision? Well, it said that that was the law of the land 
and that uh, everybody in the United States had to respect the, uh, the South's uh, legal uh, 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 position that the slave had no right that a white man was bound to respect. And it was a big deal, and the Civil War came only four years later because it was a big deal. And uh, this humanitarian, military interventionist uh, loophole, uh, actually it's superimposed on the rubble of international law, is is like that. What it seeks to say is that the United, that, that the, no nation in the world has any rights that the United States is bound to respect. Uh, and those, uh, that, that, that whole, uh, uh, that whole edifice of post World War II, uh, 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 prohibitions uh, on aggression. Uh, the, 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 the creation of a, of a, of a body of laws very elegantly, uh, that stated that the highest crime that a, that, that a country can commit, you know, countries commit crimes, and the highest crime that a country commit, can commit is to wage war against peace. And it defined what that meant by defining what the rights of nations were, and what you cannot do to nations, such as interfere in their internal affairs, that you must respect their, their sovereignty and the integrity of, of governments, to have the right to have a monopoly in the use of force within their own country, just like our own government uh, has. So you can't even define peace if you can't define what the, what, what the rights of nations are. But the United States now, in this regime, says that these nations have no rights, and therefore we can't even talk about about, about what is peace and what is not and what are crimes against peace. We are in a lawless situation and something profoundly different has changed. And I'll just give one more example. Uh, you know, uh, the reason for all of these uh, UN declarations and uh, Geneva conferences is to make it harder for aggressors to wage war against peace. It doesn't stop them, but it makes it harder. It puts some speed bumps in the road. That's all we can really do, that we engage people in a dialogue about what is forbidden and what is not. That's what human beings do. And if we had this Obama doctrine now, and I'm calling it his doctrine not because he invented it, but because he has so embraced it and integrated it into the whole U.S. Uh, diplomacy and military posture in the world. If we had had this, uh, this, this doctrine uh, in the 1960s, there would have been no need for a Tonkin Gulf incident where the United States manufactured a North Vietnamese attack on U.S. warships, uh, warships in, in order to uh, justify uh, their aggressions against Vietnam. All the United States would have had to do is say, well, we don't like uh, that regime. And that regime is mean to its people. And it puts some people in education camps and it takes, it takes property from people. And that really is not very humane. And that's all it would have to say. And that speed bump, that break against aggression would be gone. Well, that is the situation we have today. Something has really changed. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I just, let me just comment a little further. Uh, look, the, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention um, is, I think everybody in this room will accept, is the latest version of imperialism. That's what it is. Um, you know, the, the so-called right to protect or duty to protect is really a duty to protect, you know, um, the existing order of things. Um, obviously, um, the, the, what should I say, the better news is that there's been some resistance on the international, um, you know, among the various powers, particularly China and, the, and Russia, to this, uh, the application of this doctrine, having been burned um, in Libya over exactly this, I mean, with a made-up um, set of massacres that were going on in the midst of a civil war with a power that the United States was not particularly wild about, namely Gaddafi. Um, so, you know, the, this, the, the doctrine has not yet reached universal acceptance, which is a good thing, and we should be, you know, forthright in saying it's a good thing. Um, and I think that, as well, we want to be very clear that um, the, what's, you know, the, what's going on in Syria has got to be a problem for all of us, right? There is a government that is killing a lot of its people. Um, it is an undemocratic government. 
However, the United States was utterly silent in 1982, I believe, when uh, the father of the present leader uh, managed to kill 15,000 people in homes. And it was okay. It was, you know, that was the government that was there. It was okay for the Iraqi government after the United States um, had uh, done what it needed to do to kill tens of thousands of people who rose up in resistance when the United States was actually running Iraqi airspace right after um, it had defeated the Iraqis in, in Kuwait. All of that is okay um, when it's done with you know American government approval. This is a long-standing imperial notion that has, that has been there. Um, and I actually think that, you know, we should all take, as I say, we should take some comfort by the fact that there is at least some resistance on the international scene to this idea that the United States, as, you know, Glenn was saying, really gets to, you know, call the shots without any regard for law. And it is a good thing that these folks, for instance, ha were, were compelled to try to, you know, pull the wool over our eyes with uh, surveillance drones. With that said, the fact of the matter is we're, many of us have been in favor of doing things like getting video cameras to people in Bahrain um, who are being, you know, attacked by their government. Um, and that it's clear that we want to document the abuses of human rights to the extent that you can use drone technology to do that. Maybe that's a good thing. Just, you know, I, I mean, I want to be very clear that I agree that, you know, the technology is not per se the evil. The evil is the social relations and the evil is imperialism. So I, I agree with David on that, and I, I think this is, is part of what we have to discuss more, and I hope at the Drone Summit we do that, because uh, I do see drones uh, being used in a positive way by people in the environmental community. Um, I see uh, people going out on the high seas trying to find the whaling ships, very hard to find in the high seas, using it to find them for illegal whaling and stopping the illegal whaling. Um, something that the drone community likes to put out a lot is how drones were used after the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant contamination to go in where it would have been very dangerous for pilots to see the level of contamination. Um, people talk a lot about forest fires, that if you had drones over vast extenses of land that could see where a forest fire was starting, you could quickly try to stop that. So I think there are positive uses of drones. Like, it's just like saying, is there a positive use of an airplane? Um, but the, the important thing is to think it out very clearly, what are positive uses and what are uses that are just plain bad, evil, uh, and try to make a distinction, have regulations about that. I just think you have to be realistic about the nature. So yeah, the technology is probably neutral, but then you have social relations, which, and I just don't know which organizations would be able to afford a drone, and would you really want to put that much money into a humanitarian organization owning a drone? And I just think that it's unrealistic to think that this would ever be used for good. Maybe theoretically, I just think that empirically it's not going to work. There's a fundamental difference between what a nation does and what an individual does. If you want to go to Syria or any place else and take your chances and uh, help whatever side you want, uh, I have no problem with that. That's your right, and you're taking your chances. What the U U.S. government does is supposed to be di is supposed to be uh, uh, be within the parameters of international law. Uh, what all nations do is supposed to be within the parameters of international law. So private people's use of drones is one thing. Nations' use of drones uh, to to uh, uh, infiltrate other people's national territory is something entirely different, just like the cops don't have the right to do some things that you do uh, in terms of uh, surveilling your neighbors.
The answer is they don't. The, the, I mean, the, the idea that somehow that, the, that more knowledge will make them accountable, it's just not true and it won't happen. Um, I don't, there is, again, I don't believe that whatever the pictures are, um, if there's a social need to lie about it, they will be lied about. It's not the first in all time that you know, pictures lie. There were, you know, that's what photography has been about to a great extent and will be continually and that, that's the way it's going to be used. Um, again, the technology is not to me the major issue, it's the social relations behind it, the fact that the government will lie. That's, as I.F. Stone says, that's what governments do. They lie. And they will lie about war, and this government will lie about war, period. And e whether it's, you know, they can say that they've got proof positive of the weapons of mass destruction from, you know, a guy who was tortured in Uzbekistan, um, if that's, or, you know, a guy who's trying to spin them for the benefit of a couple of bankers. I mean, the fact is, the government will do will take the intelligence that it wants to, will take the pictures that it wants to, it will ultimately do what it wants unless we can figure out a way to stop it. Thor, I'd like to just have you comment on the ACLU's difficulty in getting information about what is in the possession of the government right now. Uh, yeah, sh Okay. Basically, the ACLU has filed a, a lawsuit against the U.S. government for not disclosing the rationale for killing uh, the Yemeni uh, citizen who was assassinated and for not giving enough information on the intelligence that the government uses. And the basis of the lawsuit is that you can't allow, the New York Times can't comment on the drone program, Eric Holder can't comment on the drone program publicly and yet assert when one makes a request formally that it's somehow secret. It's an inconsistency. So that's the basis of the lawsuit. And you think the courts are going to? So, uh, <laughs> well. I think that uh, that concludes our program for today. I think that it's a very important conclusion because we have to fight for our rights to know as well as to fight for our rights to privacy, fight for our rights against oppression of police in various places. At some point, we all have to ask ourselves, where do we get the energy to fight? And are we bouncing off the ropes enough? And I think that that's really what we're talking about today. So thank you for coming. Thanks.